Just over two months ago, a deep sea oil rig leased by BP exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, unleashing an oil spill which is now one of the worst ecological disasters the world has ever seen. It has put millions of people and wildlife living along vast parts of America's coastline in jeopardy. It has caused an unprecedented cooling of our relationship with the US and is costing BP billions of pounds to fix. But how exactly did this catastrophic event unfold? This is the untold story of the first 36 hours of the disaster. From the moment the rig blew up, the scramble to save the lives of its workers and the desperate attempts to salvage the rig and avoid the cataclysmic damage that followed. The Gulf of Mexico is a vast, oil-rich basin in the Atlantic Ocean that produces over a quarter of America's ever-increasing need for fuel. Forty miles off the coast of Louisiana is the site of semi-submersible oil rig Deepwater Horizon. Shortly after 10 p.m. on the 20th of April, disaster struck the Deepwater Horizon. When it suffered a massive blowout. 126 people are on board. Many are asleep. One of them is rig worker Chris Choi. I heard the first explosion and I set up and got on, set on the edge of the bed, you know, just wondering what it was. Uh, that's when the, the second larger explosion went off. I mean, I just remember being just scared to death. Chris leaves his room, walking into a deep sea rigger's worst nightmare. First thing I saw, there was the ceiling was on fire. There's a walkway right above me. Uh, that walkway was on fire. So I turned around to go back to the front of the rig, and that's when I saw the flames. Uh, as soon as I saw that, I knew there was no way we were going to put it out. We were just going to get off of there, all sure. I kept thinking, was well, we're all dead. I hadn't seen anybody until this point. I didn't know if I was the only person still on the rig or what. I run back to the front. And my chief mate is running down there towards me. And he's hollering. I can see the crane operator that fell. He said, I can see him down over by the starboard crane, and I can't get to him. And uh, while we were trying to get over there, the uh, there was some more explosions, and it just put flames in between us and the crane operator. And we didn't have a choice but to, but to turn around, uh, which is a horrible thing to have on your mind that you know you're right there next to somebody uh, that you couldn't help. The Deepwater Horizon is unlike conventional rigs built on legs. It is a state-of-the-art semi-submersible platform, costing hundreds of millions of dollars to build and is designed to drill new wells. Once in position, the two pontoons are flooded with seawater to stabilize its massive platform. This allows the rig to operate at depths of over one and a half miles. But deep sea drilling has always carried dangers. The explosion is so violent that the first distress calls the Coast Guard received come from rigs and boats several miles away from the burning platform. I took the call. The person was panicking. The person was telling me that there was a rig is on fire and he can see it. Lieutenant Nathan Houck was the lead officer on duty that night. We received a report from a man that said that an entire rig was on fire with over 100 people on board and people were jumping overboard. There's no waiting around for, for that. There's, uh, that's an immediate response. We launched everybody that we had available. Uh, we also launched every helo that we could find. Initially, when the first report came in, we didn't know whether or not there was over 100 people in the water. With everyone scrambled, four rescue helicopters are in the air within minutes. The adrenaline starts flowing immediately. Your heart starts racing immediately. Uh, there's a sense of urgency. But the helicopters have limited capacity to carry any rescue victims, and there could be more than 100 casualties already in the water. The initial explosion was 115 nautical miles away from our, our base. We can, uh, at most, rescue three to four people at a time. Where are we going to take them? What's their condition? At the time we launched, we didn't know any of this information. A few minutes later, the Coast Guard crews could actually see what they were dealing with. I could see the glow of the, the burning rig at 90 miles away. I knew this was big. It looked like that I was flying to New York City. 
As the helicopters get closer, it becomes clear just how dangerous any rescue attempt is going to be. We were hovering about half a mile to the east of the burning rig, and I could feel the intensity of the flames through the fuselage of the airframe. And I was looking into this burning hulk of metal, and it was like looking into the face of the devil. With the lives of up to 126 rig workers at risk, the Coast Guard team have to be ready to put their men into the water. When you're out there on a rig, fire breaks out, there's not, a, there's not a, whole a lot of places for you to go. The oil rig support ships, or tenders, try to cool parts of the rig so that the men on board can find a way off. They are also cooling the main superstructure to try and preserve the metal and keep it afloat until the firefighters can get there. The fire is being fed by a pipe that connects the rig to the ocean floor. These rigs are designed to be held exactly in place using thrusters under the platforms and a satellite positioning system. With that system now destroyed, the only thing holding the rig in place is the riser pipe, which moves debris and mud and oil back to the surface. As the Coast Guard's search of the rig for survivors proves initially fruitless, the only hope is that the 126 workers on board had already made their way into the lifeboats. Everybody started hollering to abandon the rig. I got the number two lifeboat, and that was, that was the lifeboat that most of the, the hurt people were in, the injured guys were in. Chris Choi helps his injured colleagues until they get lucky, when a rig supply vessel working in the area finds them drifting and hauls them on board. At that point, we had, we had a little bit of hope that, that we were going to be able to uh, rescue some people. They wanted us to pick up the critically injured first, uh, the ones that, who weren't able to walk. Coast Guard showed up, I want to say, 30 to 45 minutes after we got on the boat. They sent a couple guys down to help us. These guys are the Coast Guard's elite swimmers, highly trained rescuers who are ready to go into the water to save injured or drowning people. It's going out the door. Your adrenaline's just running. You're excited. You get on the boat, and then you see all these people that are injured, and it's kind of like, what do I do? Get people of the rail. When I first went in, my rescue swimmer, uh, Kurt Peterson, said, this is who we want to get out first. He's got really low vitals. Um, he had a severe laceration to his neck, screaming in pain. So I was like, all right, well, let, let's get him going. The driver's getting at the basket very slowly. This is a chance for the Coast Guard swimmers to assess just how badly hurt the survivors from the rig are. There's people with multiple leg fractures, blisters, charred skin. It's really undescribable. Okay, survivors at the door. While the rig continues to burn, the critically injured are flown to hospitals in Alabama and Louisiana. Seven hours after the first explosion, 115 of the 126 who are on the rig are accounted for. In the hours ahead, specialist rescue teams spring into action. Hit the road, uh, we've got a rig on fire. Respond and be at the airport as soon as you can. Dawn reveals the enormity of the rig inferno. The image is just burning in my head. I'll never forget watching that. And the Coast Guard have to step up their search. It's not over yet. It's, it's not uncommon for us to find people after they've been in the water for a day or two. Developing story to tell you about this morning. The Coast Guard is searching for at least 11 missing oil rig workers off of the coast of Louisiana. They vanished after an explosion last night. Search teams are hoping that they are on lifeboats in the Gulf of Mexico. Eight hours since the Deepwater Horizon oil platform exploded off the American coast, the massive oil fire continues to hold the firefighting teams at bay and stop them from getting on board. The only thing keeping the floating platform in place is the riser waste pipe. If this snaps, the rig could start bleeding oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Specialist teams are now desperately needed. There's a thousand bits and pieces that compile a mobilization of, uh, of any sort, uh, especially a major one in this, uh, in this regard. You've got to get people in motion, and you've got to get equipment in motion so that uh, you no know time is wasted on the emergency. The Salvas face a 400-mile journey from Houston to the Louisiana coast before they can board a boat out to the rig.
A second team has been called in from Holland, who are specialists at fighting fires at sea. No one knows how long the rig can survive the fire and stay afloat. Salvage expert James Waite is the first to get the call to put together an advance party. An experienced offshore firefighter, Waite has also been a sea captain for 17 years. Well, the, uh, the phone rang early in the morning, and uh, basically the conversation went like this, Jim, how fast can you pack, hit the road, uh, we've got a rig on fire, need you to respond and be at the airport as soon as you can. At the time when we were mobilized, um, we had no way of knowing how serious the fire was on board. As Wait races to Houston Airport, information about what happened is coming in from the boats around the rig. Whatever caused the explosions is still unknown. The rig is still burning. But no one knows how many rig workers have escaped and how many are still missing. And of course, when the word came out, not all were accounted for. In your mind, um, everything changes. Now your emphasis shifts from that of a simple firefighting evolution to a search and rescue op operation supported by a firefighting evolution. And you start hoping that you can have some success with the uh, search and rescue. If the salvage team are to stabilize the rig, stop it from sinking and tow it to shore, putting the fire out has to be the first priority. That means using their own specialist firefighting equipment, all of which needs to be urgently transported out to the rig. Any ETA on your trucks, any info on that? They will also need specialist equipment to be able to board the rig. So a total of 42 tons of equipment needs to be taken to the coast by road. I have three trucks. OK. My first thoughts, uh, again, are what do we have, what do we need, where can we get it, how fast can we get it there? About two hours? Yeah. OK, good. I was on the phone immediately and started looking for vessels. We started calling all of the boat companies. Ray has located a boat to take the salvers out to sea at Port Fourchon in Louisiana, which serves 90% of the Mexican Gulf's deepwater platforms. The burning rig is then at least a further 10 hours by boat from Fourchon. As the convoy of four trucks heads out to the coast, it is already more than 10 hours after the explosion. All right, good. The trucks are going to leave here somewhere at 3 or 4 o'clock, I think. So they, they should be down there just about midnight by the time you guys are ready. In Fourchon, the second member of the salvage advance party, Just van den Driest, joins James Waite on the first boat out to the burning rig. It's a very mixed feeling, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, it's a major disaster. On the other hand, it's also a, a big job waiting for you. The ships fighting the flames are oil field vessels that were in the area when the rig first exploded. But they are still having little effect. Their hoses continue to try and cool parts of the rig so that anyone who might still be trapped on board has a better chance of surviving. On the shore, the fate of the workers still missing remains anyone's guess. Just wait and see. Wait until we hear something. That's all we can do right now. Them things blow up out there. You don't know who was alive and, and who was not. Out at the rig, 10 hours after the explosion, those who have been found and rescued, but who do not need urgent hospital treatment, are still on board the boats that save them. And we sat there and pretty much watched the, the rig burn for six or seven hours. The images just burned in my head. I'll never forget watching that. We all got in a big group on the, on the boat of the deck, and you know, we figured out you know, we were missing 11 guys. And you know, we just kept praying that, that somebody would find them. The Coast Guard step up their efforts. The helicopters are joined by a plane. All five aircraft fly continuous missions, making the most of every resource at their disposal to turn the frenzied search for survivors into a fully coordinated mission. It's a horrible thing, but when something like this does happen, I feel like uh, we're trained uh, well enough to, to respond. We're creating search patterns uh, based on uh, conditions on scene out there. We, we have computer programs and stuff that help us analyze the currents 
and, uh, and, and we launch assets accordingly. Our goal is to save everybody. We just don't, don't give up, uh, just continue the search. By now, the explosion is the headline story around the globe. The company that owns the rig says there was no sign of trouble before the blast, and it's too soon to know what may have caused it. The fact that this was such a massive explosion and it is still burning suggests that this was very fast. It was some kind of combustion of uh, a mixture of natural gas and oil, quite possibly. The shocking images of the burning rig mean the world can clearly see what the rescuers are up against, and viewers around the world wait for news of the missing men. Tonight's breaking news, the frantic search for those 11 missing oil rig workers. Um, Admiral Landry, do you have any sense whether there are any survivors here? We don't want to give up hope that we might be able to find the, other, the 11 unaccounted for personnel, so we have an active search and rescue case going on throughout the night. It's not over yet. It's, it's not uncommon for us to find people after they've been in the water for a day or two. Shortly after dark, the four trucks containing the emergency salvage equipment make it over the state line and are now in Louisiana. But the hardest part of the high-tech cargo's journey is still ahead. So in Port Fourchon, when the first of the trucks arrives, it needs to be unloaded in double quick time. Okay, you truck number one. Okay, I'm flash. Which is where Steve Boudreau comes in. Everybody knows me all the way around the world is Flash Boudreaux. Then that was going to come off. The three inch here is going to come off. And they call him Flash for a reason, is he can outwork any three people that I've ever met, that's for sure. Boudreaux doesn't waste a moment getting everything from the trailers onto the boat. Who's all this stuff? Ah, uh, it's technical stuff, I can't tell you. If I tell you, I gotta kill you. Coffee time! But although he quickly has the rescue gear loaded into the boat, the boat can't set sail until the truck with the firefighting gear arrives. Meanwhile, the advance party salvage team are eight hours into their boat trip and are getting their first view of the deep water horizon. You could see the fire for hours before we even got on scene. It was that intense. You could see the fire billowing into the air over the horizon. It's a horrendous, uh, terrific fire. I mean, it's uh, unlike anything you've ever seen. Suckers in the water on one side. So uh, you see a huge structure. It's about a football pitch that big, and the, and the flames are about, uh, I think, about 200 feet up in the air. So it's, it's huge. Both Juiced and James are now realizing that it's unlikely that anyone else survived the initial blast. Emotionally, what's going through your head, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but there's a real connection um, amongst people that go to sea. And when you know that there are souls that are left unaccounted for, you can't help but feel it. And um, it impacts how you fight the fire. How to extinguish the fire is still the burning question for all the rescue workers. Despite continuing efforts, the flames are showing no signs of relenting. As the world watches every moment of their progress, the fire on the rig is being fueled by oil flowing up the riser pipe from the seabed. It began with a powerful explosion less than 24 hours ago. A column of flames shooting into the night sky over the Gulf of Mexico. At last word, the oil rig still was burning and could topple into the water at any moment. The source of that fire is, is predominantly coming from the wellhead itself. It's crude oil that is leaching from this wellhead. And as long as that crude is leaching, we're going to continue to see that fire. Shutting down the source of the fuel means working up to a mile below the ocean surface. And what we're doing now is they've got a remotely operated vehicle, a subsurface vehicle, that, that can uh, work to secure that source, to plug that, uh, that wellhead, if you will. ROVs are remotely operated underwater robots. They're being used to try to close the blowout preventer, a vital safety valve on the ocean floor, which should have cut off the flow of oil when things started to go wrong. For some reason, it failed. 
The constant flow of oil means there is no way the salvage team can reduce the flames enough for them to board the rig and put the fire out. From our perspective, the only way that this fire was going to be able to evolve into the next uh, phase of the firefighting evolution was not until the fuel could be secured on board the rig. If the well can be sealed, the fire will become less fierce and allow the firefighting salvers a chance to get on board. If they can't get onto the rig, their chances of saving it are becoming slimmer by the minute. Meanwhile, in New Orleans, the charter jet with the second salvage team has just landed from Holland, despite Icelandic volcanoes. Leading the news this afternoon, we're live as a cloud of volcanic ash turns Britain into a no-fly zone. Air traffic over the UK had been shut down for six days. The airports opened just in time for them to take off. We were lucky in that respect because I know that the Icelandic volcano has put air travel into a, into a turmoil and that had just subsided that day or the day before really to open up the air spaces. And uh, in that regard, we, we were fortunate enough to get a charter aircraft immediately for the crew coming out of uh, Holland. But the Dutch team still face the 80-mile journey to Port Fourchon, where Flash Boudreau is now unloading the second truck and chasing the others. Hello? Yeah, listen, uh, Ray just called, and uh, we got one truck that's kind of falling behind. 40 miles out at sea, the tender boats continue to hose down the structure of the rig, trying to cool it desperately hoping to keep it intact until the salvage experts can work out a way to save the rig. There's a tremendous amount of concern about the fact that this rig was not on a stable um, footing. Its dynamic positioning system was out. Because it wasn't really a rig fire, you know, it was, it was a well fire. The, the whole well was on fire and it was uh, spitting out oil uh, uh, like crazy. You don't really know how long a rig can sustain that kind of heat. Yep, uh, if they blow the riser pipe, it may go. And the only thing that was tethering it to the seabed was the riser. And in the back of our minds, we were all thinking that now if it was to rupture at the hull, now we have an uncontrolled release which could hit the underside of the rig, spray out and hit our, our response vessels. Hey, Paul, come look at this. Look at you think they're steaming? But you don't really think about that. It's 24 hours since the rig first exploded and started a chain of events that are now hurtling towards a catastrophic disaster. While the rescuers try to find a way to save the rig, many have already given up hoping to save the missing 11 men who may have been trapped on board. Over the next few hours, the inferno on the rig intensifies. You start hearing explosions, you hear them all through the night. The Coast Guard refused to give up their search for the missing men. You just keep trying. You just keep going. You give it 100%. And the salvers fear they are fighting a losing battle. Just listening to this rig, was, you, you were listening to, the, to, to, to a ship die. Twenty-four hours after the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded 40 miles off the American coast, the second part of the salvage team reaches Port Fourchon in Louisiana. Their advance party has already closed in on the rig, where the uncontainable fire is being fed by oil coming up a pipe from the seabed. The game plan is to get everything loaded up and then proceed out. Uh, and we'll see what we've got, what we've got left um, when we get there. But the one issue is time. You need to shut down the, the gas supply as quickly as possible. Yeah, we'll put that third one there. He said we can have that all. If they cannot, then it's going to be uh, a more complicated situation. If the oil flow can be stopped, they plan to board the Deepwater Horizon and fight the fire face to face. Constant training for these salvers is vital. Even though they are experienced seamen who have had to deal with the deadly dangers of offshore fires many times, fighting fires at sea is particularly difficult. Conventional firefighting on, a, on an oil rig or a ship, you have set goals, which you've been trained and drilled in. Uh, you try and establish fire boundaries, um, and you do that by simple things such as closing watertight doors and bulkheads. 
in cooling bulkheads and set a boundary that the fire cannot progress past, uh, much like a firefighter, at, uh, a forest firefighter does when he digs a trench. Um, and then you progress through the oil rig or the vessel in a way that you extinguish the fires and cool and overhaul the fires so they don't rekindle. But this particular case was everything but traditional. This was not a traditional um, oil rig fire. Uh, this was an uncontrolled oil well fire with incredibly intense heat sufficient to keep the firefighters at bay until that fuel could be cut off. Out at sea, the Coast Guard is still working relentlessly. Their helicopters by now are forced to use other rigs in the area for fuel stops so they can continue their search for the missing men. Well, there's some, uh, some rigs up here in front of us. Uh, it's a large helicopter, but um, from what we can carry in the back, it's relatively small. We have uh, at most three hours of uh, time aloft before we have to refuel. Um, we're, f we're flying as close as to a half mile to a quarter mile circling the rig, uh, looking for survivors in the water and also using that rig to um, use as a reference point. You just keep trying. You keep trying as long as there's a possibility of them to survive. You just keep going. You give it 100 percent. The Salvo's advance party of James and Juiced also haven't given up hope. But the situation is about to get worse. That, that back corner is gone. You start hearing explosions. You hear them all through the night. You know, you hear vessels building up steam and then blowing apart, and then you hear, you hear steel on steel, things falling down. That crane's gone. You can see where the crane, there it is. Yeah, where the crane was. Look, there's the crane rack. It's melted. Burning into the second night, the flames are still too big and hot for anyone to board the rig and there is still no progress in closing off the oil flow from below. But back in Fourchamps, Steve Boudreau continues to make preparations to board the rig. The rig and everything is still on fire. You can't get on board, but everything is being phased in, you know, for a response. And it's a joint effort with everybody. We try to stop it and save it. Right now, we're trying to develop, get our teams together in position for the attack mode. As soon as we can get the fire and everything shut down, that's when we really got to go into play there is still no new survivors. Everybody has the same thing on their mind is, what about the other guys, you know, the people that, that we still have uh, to be accountable for? And I think that's the most important thing at all, because everything else can get fixed. The deep water horizon has now been burning for almost 30 hours. Good morning. At least 11 people are missing after an explosion on an oil rig off the coast of the American state of Louisiana. The rig, which had 126 workers in total, is burning hours after the explosion. 17 people were injured by the blast. For the second time since the initial rig explosion, the sun rises to reveal a clearer picture. And it isn't a good one. As the world watches, the salvage team struggles to see how they can save the rig. It's just an incredible amount of heat. And over time, that heat just structurally degrades the steel. And that was very evident when the sun came up that there had been some serious, serious degradation of the structural integrity of the rig. And you could actually see what used to be incredibly stout steel uh, sagging uh, like a clothesline. And you could see steel structures that were blazing cherry red. Feel the heat from it now. Early in the morning, the, the explosions on board, they started to become uh, uh, more frequent. And uh, you hear the fire roaring. And when you hear all these big steel uh, structures falling down and collapsing, it's an overwhelming uh, type of sound. Back in Port Fourchon, the specialist firefighting equipment shipped from Houston has arrived. All those boxes come, the hydraulic hoses come. Flash Boudreau now has to get the gear onto the salvage boat, knowing time is fast running out. We got a job to do. We have to be there. 
You know, people are waiting. When it all goes together good, it makes everybody, the team, look good. You don't mind? All the way over there by that basket. But it's at least a 10-hour journey out to the rig, which may not still be standing. Now, a double danger is becoming clear, once again from the riser pipe below the surface. The area around the deep water horizon is littered with undersea oil and gas pipes from other rigs. These pipelines will be vulnerable if the burning rig breaks loose and drifts out of control. If the riser was to separate from the wellhead, and that concern is twofold, now you have a rig which is going to continue to burn as it drifts across the Gulf of Mexico with a 5,000 foot tail riser dragging across the bottom like a big anchor, which could damage any number of subsea pipelines and other assets that could cause a catastrophe. And now you've got a oil spill where before you had near complete combustion of the oil that was coming out of this rig. Now you would have no combustion at all in a oil spill, catastrophic consequences of the worst kind you can imagine. One that you can't stop, one you can't access, one 5,000 feet below the ocean. Engineers using the remotely operated vehicles are still trying to close the blowout preventer valve and shut down the flow from the oil well. None of us said it, but we all had a very sinking feeling in our hearts that if they didn't get the oil secured, if that sheer cut of the riser was unsuccessful and it went on for much longer, that um, our chances were rapidly decreasing that we'd be able to save the vessel. At the salvage company's headquarters in Houston, new specialists continued to arrive. The team are trying to work out how to tow the rig back to port once or if the fire can be put out. What it looks like is that the, the well is feeding the fire. And as long as the fire is raging like this, that you can't do anything. The failure to stop the flow of oil is starting to make those involved in the rescue realize an even bigger disaster might be on the way. The potential for a major disaster is always there. Oh, you know immediately that this is major. That's, that's for certain. Uh, anything with explosions and, and fires in the middle of the night uh, on an oil rig or a ship or, or any type of situation, you know it's major. On shore, along the entire Gulf Coast, residents and fishermen from four American states are also beginning to fear the worst. This is the gateway right here to the Gulf. It's bad on the environment, you know? Like for the fish, the shrimp, the crabbing, it's bad for the fishermen. It makes their living doing that. 36 hours after the first explosion, time runs out. But about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, for about 15 minutes, you know, you really heard a lot of, of, of really loud noises. So we knew it was uh, something was going uh, going wrong. As we were combating the fire, uh, we could hear um, the the rig uh, creaking and groaning and settling. And uh, during that period of time, there was multiple explosions. Uh, some of which was um, propelling debris up in the air. Just listening to this rig, it was, you, you were listening to, the, to, to, to a ship die. You hear like cranes falling down and decks collapsing and everything. At that point in time, you know, I, I, I issued a warning to all the firefighting units to be ready for emergency escape. Then when at quarter past 10, the list started changing, you, you started to see it changing rapidly. And from my vantage point on the stern, which was 
directly in eye shot of the lowest point, we could see the aft starboard corner starting to slowly drop into the sea. It was about five or seven minutes before the complete uh, structure went down. We started to back off, and by 10.22, she was gone. She slipped under the waves. That's a pretty indescribable moment. You see it going down after, you know, these vessels have been fighting the fire for 36 hours and, uh, you know, everybody doing their best to, to, to save this. When you lose a vessel, it's just a somber moment. You feel the loss. Uh, you feel the failure. I think, unfortunately for us, we were, uh, we were fighting a losing battle from the start. situation room happening now disaster upon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico as a burning oil rig sinks raising fears of an environmental nightmare when the deep water horizon sank almost a mile to the ocean floor there was no sign of any oil coming from the wellhead or the riser pipe but the fire from the sunken rig continues to burn off the oil still on the surface of the sea and the salvers are becoming concerned that the drama is not yet over and that the well might not be fully sealed. It's in 5,000 feet of water. Of course, it's got the potential to be catastrophic, but, uh, but truthfully, I don't know to what degree. The salvage team can play no further part in the rescue. Their job ended when the rig sank. For all the offshore specialists, it's a depressing moment. Some of them turn back before they even reach the scene. It's very sad to see such a piece of equipment go under. So there's no point in, 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 in going out there. The Coast Guard are next to face depressing disappointment. Three days after the explosion, their search for survivors is called off. The 11 missing men are presumed to have perished on the platform during the initial explosion. You think about the victims' families. Uh, you, you have to maintain uh, professionalism and make sure that you, you are doing your job well and stuff, but it's impossible to uh, to separate yourself from the human aspect of, of what's going on, the seriousness that there were 11 people unaccounted for. As the enormity of the tragedy is still sinking in, crude oil from the depths of the Gulf starts to appear on the surface, forming a spill that quickly turns into the biggest offshore oil pollution emergency America has ever seen. Upon exiting the channel, we'll be heading on a course of 260. Once again, the Coast Guard are back in the front line as an armada of ships rushes to try to stop the oil from devastating the entire area. This is a Coast Guard cutter, the Oak, a state of the art multi purpose ship that is one of many Coast Guard vessels diverted to the crisis. This has been designated as a spill of national significance. The latest imagery seems to show it somewhere in the area of 30 to 40 miles uh, offshore. As the spill spreads rapidly westwards, the oak is trying to find the leading edge. When it proves difficult to spot the edge of the oil from sea level, planes are deployed to track it and guide the Coast Guard vessels to the right place. Sight any oil that the technicians believe is recoverable. We're going to uh, slow down, come DIW, and we're going to put the arm out. 
The oak is fitted with special equipment that can remove crude oil from the surface of the sea. Fast heaving! We've never done this before. We've just done annual training for it, so there's going to be a few growing pains, hopefully nothing too major, but it'll be nice to actually see this equipment put into use and actually recover oil. The ship has a massive pump, which sits on the water and skims the oil into a huge bladder, which the oak tows alongside. The skimmer itself is, is pretty simple. It's called a weir skimmer. Only the very top surface of the water, where the oil is, is allowed to spill over inside. And at the bottom of that dish is a little container uh, that, that grabs the oil. It gets pumped out through a tube across the, uh, the ship's deck and into the bladder, which will hold all that oil. This is the first time they have used the oak to clear oil. But pressure for results is growing as the deep water oil spill continues to dominate international headlines. Meanwhile, 42,000 gallons of oil a day escaping into the Gulf of Mexico. It's already formed a slick measuring hundreds of square miles. And as the oil moves towards the coast, it's threatening marshes, beaches, and wildlife in four states. The Coast Guard are now at the focal point of the world's growing concern that this disaster is becoming uncontainable. We call this press conference as we have every day to give you the latest information on the Deepwater Horizon incident. The world is also monitoring the oil industry's efforts to stop the flow of oil from the seabed. No one knows exactly how much oil is spewing into the Gulf Basin but within a few days, it's estimated to be as much as a million liters a day. As the spill continues unstemmed, NASA satellites reveal a giant slick the size of Jamaica. Thousands of rescue workers are attacking the oil on all fronts, using planes to drop dispersal agents, burning it, and putting out booms around the coastline to protect the wildlife and beaches, while engineers keep working a mile below the surface to try and cap the flow. 30 miles from shore, the crew of the Oak see firsthand how the oil has started to affect the diverse range of creatures that live in the sea. So, took a sharp turn to port so that we didn't, didn't kill a little turtle. We're out here to save the environment, so if we catch a turtle in the process of saving the environment, I guess we're not really doing our job. The oak skimmer sucks up 100,000 liters of crude before the bladder they store it in is full. It's then loaded onto a supply vessel and taken back to shore to be safely disposed of. The contents of that first bladder, once refined, are enough to fill the fuel tanks of a thousand cars. But as the slick migrates towards the coast, rescue vessels like the Oak struggle to keep the oil at sea, where they hope, perhaps in vain, to collect it. In the first four weeks after the disaster, the Oak has collected over a million liters of crude oil. In the 10 weeks since the Deepwater Horizon exploded and sank, the slick has become the largest offshore oil spill in American history. The disaster has touched many millions of lives and threatened or damaged mile after mile of coastline, and it's still spewing tens of thousands of barrels a day. By the end of June, over 6,000 boats and around 100 aircraft are battling the slick. 36,000 people are fighting to contain it. No efforts have been successful in fully capping the well. And BP have recently promised the US people that they will deliver a cleanup program that will cost more than $20 billion and last more than a generation. We've a whole host of Hollywood A-listers for you next tonight on Five. Samuel L. Jackson, Eva Mendes and Ed Harris star in our movie premiere of the crime thriller Cleaner.